So I think the best thing to do, I'll just speak maybe 20 or so minutes and then just have a conversation. I think that's nicer. So feel free to eat. Uh, oh, good to see you. <laughs> and, um, uh, but ba basically, I, I was a, a Jesuit scholastic, which is a Catholic seminary for about four years or so. Um, and, I, and I left a year ago, but a um, lo lot of love for the Jesuits. And I, uh, Mark um, invited me to talk, which I was very honored to do, uh, just about my experience with the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, same thing. So with the Society, um, Ignatian Spirituality, which um, Mark is involved with, I, w I was involved with, um, and how kind of I went from Colgate, I got to the Jesuits, and I left, and just some things that I, I learned along the way that I thought might be nice to, uh, Mark thought, and I thought might be nice to share with you. Um, so just talk about the Jesuit way, finding God in and out of religious life. So this is a, a picture of me when I was a, a Jesuit. And uh, the funny thing, uh, I had read about the school in the Colgate scene. It's a school that I teach at. It's called Washington Jesuit Academy. It's fourth to eighth grade. And uh, the Jesuits have these middle schools for uh, low-income boys um, to give them a good education. Um, so we do a lot of fundraising. And um, you have a stage in the Jesuits that's called Long Experiment. And they send you uh, somewhere to work, live as a Jesuit as if you were already a priest. Um, and I got sent to this school, which I had, again, read about in the Colgate scene. It was how, uh, two Colgate alums founded it. And one of my friends who had founded it was going off, and they needed a biology teacher. So everything like the stars aligned, and they said, go to this school and teach. And I had a ball there. And even at that time, I was still kind of struggling with this uh, calling. I was like, do I really want to be a priest? Like, I know I love these kids, and I love what they're doing, and I love the Jesuit I ideals and the spirituality. Um, but this picture, they have a, a, a picture in the um, cafeteria of all those class years. So when I came back, when I left the Jesuits, they invited me to work there again, and I went back. But they have this picture there um, on the wall. And uh, so it's a good reminder of me, and I think that's kind of one of the facets of Jesuit spirituality in that, like, you know, God is present in all things, and it's, um, you know, the kind of cliche, spirituality cre cliche where God writes straight with crooked lines. So I like seeing this picture of me. Um, and I showed it to all the kids, and they get a kick out of it. I'm like, oh, you know, I a teacher, you know, I have a collar. But, um, but I, I mean, I don't know. That's, that's also, I'm also a middle schooler at heart, so that's why I teach there. But, um, but uh, th so the three main things I want to talk to you, pray dreaming. That's another thing of Ignatian spirituality. Uh, St. Ignatius believed that very much. Like, his daydreams is kind of what made him do what he did. Uh, he believed God spoke to us through our, the things we fantasize about, the things like when we think we're being off task or being distracted might actually be God's calling to you. Um, Jesuit Ignatian spirituality and in my own faith journey. I was educated by Quakers actually. Uh, and then I came to Colgate where I met Mark, where I met Newman, and then I met the Catholics uh, through the Jesuits. Um, so a little bit about all that. Who is St. Ignatius of Loyola? So uh, how many of you have heard of St. Ignatius of Loyola? Let me just see. Oh, so most people. So. It's a very quick one. He was born in 1491 in, in Spain. He's a Basque. But uh, you know, if you know history, that was just the reconquest of Spain at that time, a very interesting time in Spain. He was a soldier. Um, he was the, 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 the second half of a very big family as a son, so he really didn't have a lot going for him, even though his family was, I guess you could say, minor nobility class. Um, and well, I'll go through this. I did pictures, because I teach middle school, so it's going to be very visual, less text. So he was a kid. He, he didn't have a much of a shot, so he, was, he wanted to be in the court. That was the best thing he could do. Uh, so he went to the court. He tried to find a way to work his way up. He actually um, has a criminal record. He's one of the many saints with a criminal record. He, he, he got caught brawling one day, and he was actually technically, um, I think, tonsured. So he was kind of a minor cleric. Uh, so he kind of got out of it because he was like, he, he showed like kind of his priest card, basically, and he got out of jail because of that. But he was a rough guy. He was. Uh, they say, ladies, man, you take with that what you will, but um, that's, that's what he was. So, uh, he, so he, he had to make a name for himself. So at that time, Spain was battling France, and at Pamplona, he, he led a very small Spanish group against a very larger French group. He was so charismatic, it was essentially a suicide mission, but he led these people to, um, they, he led the Spanish to fight, um, and the Spanish were like, I don't know, but they fought anyway. Uh, but a cannonball shattered his leg. And as soon as he went down, they're like, okay, we surrender, because th he was the main reason they were fighting. He was just trying to make a name for himself. He was a very egotistical guy. Um, but he collapsed, and the French were so impressed, they carried him back to his, uh, to his home. When he was home and he was healing, he wanted uh, the books of the time, which were, I guess, the equivalent of, you could say, like telenovelas or whatever, like just this kind of thing that everybody watches. But they didn't have him in the house. The only thing they had was Life of the Saints and Life of Christ. 
so he was kind of bummed out. <laughs> but uh, during his, oh, the other thing about his recovery, his leg was shattered. So, um, but he was like, I'm not, literally, he said, I'm not gonna look good in my tights. He was a ladies' man. So he was like, uh, he had to do this excruciating surgery. They're like, you're probably gonna, die. it's a miracle you're alive, but you're probably gonna die if we do this surgery. He's like, I don't care, do it, because I need my leg. I'm a ladies' man. So he, uh, they healed the leg, but he still had a limp, and he was so devastated because, again, like, he was, he, he had to make it in the court. Like, he, this is what he had to do. So he's kind of bummed out, and he starts reading Life of the Saints, Life of Christ, and he starts getting these feelings, these uh, emotional movements, and he starts seeing, like, he starts reading about St. Francis and St. Dominic, and he's like, if they could do these great things, why can't I do these great things? And he, he starts having this first of many conversions. Um, and, I, and I think I like to think of it more as one of many conversions as opposed to just one light bulb moment. I think um, it's, 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 it's a better, the story makes more sense if you think about it like that. Um, so he becomes a pilgrim. And like, if you know anybody, I'm a convert. If you know anybody who recently joins a faith, there's a lot of uh, zealous, zealousness. So um, he's a pilgrim. So he goes out, he gives everything away. Um, like he gives all his clothes to this beggar and the beggar ends up getting arrested because they're like, you, you robbed somebody for this clothes. So they, like, they, br they brutalize this beggar they, and say, they're like, no, 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 I give him my clothes, it's fine. Like, but he does these kinds of things. And this is a, a very, it's a Jesuit joke, but like he's traveling on the road and he meets a, a, a so-called Moor and they're discussing the Virgin Mary. And uh, the more is like, I get the virgin birth and everything, but I disagree with the Catholic teaching that she was a virgin after birth. And then he goes off. And then Ignatius gets so mad because he just became a cat, like a religious person. He's like, I'm, this guy, I want to kill this guy. How could he say that about uh, the Blessed Mother? And he's a fork in the road and he's riding a donkey. And the donkey, he's like, all right, God, if you go left where the moor went, I'll kill him. If you go right, I won't kill him. And uh, so he goes, the, the, the donkey goes right. And the Jesuit joke is that like ever since then, asses have been making decisions in the society of Jesus. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> but he, get, he, gets, he gets to a lot of trouble. He's, uh, he goes out, he starts preaching, he starts developing this kind of spiritual exercises based on these emotional movements in his heart um, about how to discern, how to see where God is calling you. And he gets a big following. And uh, at this time is the Inquisition. And there's a specific heresy called the, like the Alumbrados. And what they believed was that God can talk to you individually. And at that time in the church, it was like, no, the priest is God. Like, you don't need to worry about God talking to you individually. So he, it, he got arrested by the Inquisition. Um, luckily, he wasn't um, killed or anything, but he was very close to um, being executed. Um, so he gathers these companions. He meets these companions who initially are very annoyed at him, um, but tend to end up loving him. They take vows together to each other. And eventually they say, we want to live a life of service. We want to develop these spiritual exercises. Let's take vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. They go to the Pope and they say, we want to be a religious order. And that's the Jesuits. Um, just really bl briefly, like Ignatian discernment is different than decisions. Decisions are like, you know, what am I going to have, a salad or, um, or meat today? Um, discernment is for like exceptional matters, interior level. You, t you have to gather information broadly. Um, takes time. You bring it to prayer. And for me, like discernment, a, a lot of discernment for me, like I had a lot of these experiences, like do I want to become a Catholic? Do I want to become a Jesuit? Do I now want to become a Jesuit? Um, and what helped me was a lot of this kind of discernment. It's like you involve other people, you know, you bring it to prayer, you, um, you know, you see where your emotions moving you and what can God be saying through these emotions um, as opposed to like a decision. It's like, oh, I guess I'll do this or I guess I'll do that. Um, so very briefly, what, what Ignatius developed in his spiritual exercises was um, he believed that there are two kind of major movements. One is consolation, and that comes from the good spirit, and this is something we should follow. So those things where you're moved to greater peace, um, excuse me, greater faith, hope, and love, um, these are things that God might be calling to you. And they might not necessarily be something that you think is possible or that you think you're capable of doing, um, but nonetheless, the emotion is still there. So, um, you know, you can think of it for a lot of people saying like, well, I, I really want to go to med school, but I don't think I got it. But there's, you know, that's the thing that keeps them up at night dreaming about medical school or dreaming about, um, you know, the things they can do as a doctor. And it fills them with this enthusiasm um, that doesn't really make sense on paper, but still they feel that tug. That's consolation, Ignatius believed. That's God calling you to, to possibly a vocation. Um, desolation is, and it's not necessarily happiness and sadness, so like desolation is not just you're sad, but it's more like this kind of, 
I'm, I've lost faith, hope, and love. Like, I just everything sucks. And the thing about desolation, what Ignatius found out, desolation can usually come in the form of what he called an angel of light. And, the, 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 and what we call the evil spirit, if you want, the devil. But it will come to you speaking very nicely, but it's actually not from God. So um, a lot of times, like in my own experience, as a, even as a Jesuit, but also like a lot of people have had this, whether in religious life or, you know, it's like you should want to do this. This is a good thing. You should want to, you know, sacrifice yourself. You should want to be a savior to other people. Like, why don't you want to do this? That's a nice thing to do. And it sounds good on the level, but Ignatius said you can always tell the devil by its, by its tail. Um, but what's the end of that? Are you really doing that for God or are you doing that just for your own pride, for your own? Um, thing and that's why it helps to have like trusted people to talk to a spiritual counselor um, a community a faith community to say you know I've been thinking about this and this I'm not sure if who's really calling me to this but that's why in discernment it helps to also do it communally um, because sometimes when we get caught in our own head you know a lot of things can sound like good ideas but the end you know that tale as Ignatius called it is not necessarily uh, from God uh, so what's the spirituality I love um, one thing about the Jesuits is uh, they, they keep this tradition from St. Ignatius pretty much untouched. But I like this picture. Uh, I used to write in a lot of seminarians. We write, we, they wrote for this uh, thing called the Jesuit Post. So we have articles every day about whatever we want to write about. But it's like this kind of thing where it's like it's from Ignatius and then you see the guy with the laptop. And like the thing about Jesuits is like you meet one Jesuit, you've met one Jesuit. Like totally different people. I love the guys like all like we have this, uh, you have to do so many interviews to be a Jesuit and you have to do like a day and a half psychological review. And the joke is like, they want to see not if you're not crazy, but if you're the right amount of crazy to join the Jesuits. So like, <laughs> it's just a bunch of guys who are the right amount of crazy. Um, guys do it for different reasons. Um, but I think it's a lot of it is based on that spirituality, that wanting to, as Pope Benedict said to the Jesuits, is like, you know, your guy's mission is to explain the church to the world and the world to the church. They stand at that kind of margin uh, between the two. Um, and that's where they should be. They should be at the margins. They should be right there um, at the edge of everything so that they can be present to everybody. And if someone has that kind of desire, the Jesuits is, you know, a place for them. Um, or, you know, or Ignatian spirituality or what have you. But that, that's what really pa made me passionate. That's what I loved. Like, joining the Catholic Church, it was like, um, I'll talk about that later, but it was like that. It was like all my best friends were Catholic, and I didn't even know it. And I was like, what is this? you know, this kind of vibe, I like this vibe. And then I went to Georgetown with the Jesuits and I saw the sermons they were saying. And, um, you know, growing up not in a religious house, it really struck me that they were very about God and the real life experiences, not this kind of pie in the sky uh, sort of thing, which I, I, I still don't like and I still um, struggle with. Um, this is, a, so Ignatius, one of his spiritual exercises, Mark has done it, I've done it. It's called the 30-day the, the retreat, the long retreat. And it's, it's split up into four weeks. And um, it's kind of like you, you go to this retreat and you learn about your, your, you look at your life with God and you basically read the scriptures and you have like, you talk with God for 30 days um, or however you schedule it. But the last meditation is a, it's called the contemplation to d attain divine love. And it's basically coming to this realization that, you know, as one Jesuit said in a sermon that I love, he said, God doesn't just love you, he's crazy about you. And God just wants the best for you. And you're going to figure out what the best is for you, but um, that's what God wants. God doesn't want you to suffer. God doesn't want you to be unhappy. God wants the best. And I love this picture from the retreat house I was with. And Ignatius has this one meditation, and he's like, you know, when Jesus was resurrected, we don't really know where he first went, but he's like, I think he would go to, to visit his mom and, um, and uh, see Mary. And I always thought that was, a, and I prayed with this a lot. And if you see on the sides, too, there's like all this, like, you know, war and stuff like that. And I think f as the f one of the final meditations uh, for the 30 day, for the long retreat, it's a very powerful one because this is exactly what Jesuit spirituality is about. It's like God present in this really messed up world that we live in um, and God coming in this peace and this love and just wanting, wanting to bring that peace and love to the world. Like that's anyone who follows Jesuit spirituality, that's what you're looking to do. Um, a lot of you, I'm just put up a bunch of different quotes that many of you might have heard, like man for others. Every Jesuit school is like that. We're raising men and women for others. Um, care for the whole person. Um, this is attributed to Pedro Rupe. He didn't actually say, but fall in love, stay in love, and it will decide everything. That's a big key of discernment. Like, where, who are, what are you in love with? That's what's gonna, that's where you need to be. Finding God in all things, majus the more. 
um, Jim Martin. Have any of you read Jim Martin's books? Like, he was one of the ways I got into the church because just very practical things about faith, about religion, like to someone that could understand them, and also with humor. Like, I grew up in, a, in the Ethiopian Orthodox tradition, which is a beautiful tradition, but, you know, it's kind of like, you, when you grow up in that, it's, it's, I think a lot of religions have it, actually. It's like, you shouldn't really be laughing with religion. You shouldn't be joking with God. And he has a whole book about just like the saints and how humor is, is very holy. Um, and I, I like this one. I, I show this when I do confirmation. It's like, I hope I find someone who looks at me the way Bill Clinton looks at these balloons. And like, that's, <laughs> that's the way, I mean, <laughs> when you're struggling with prayer, which happens, it's natural, it's normal, but like, this is God's gaze on you. Like, this is what we're, we're raised on spirituality. Like, God loves you so much. And, uh, you know, Greg Boyle said, he's a Jesuit who works with the, the gangsters in Homeboy Industries, the former gangsters. And he's like the kind of God who you tell God how much of a sinner you are and God doesn't know what you're talking about. Like God just loves you so much and that's the point you start in prayer. Um, whereas like the evil spirit will say like, oh no, you're such a bad person. How can you even approach God? How can you even approach the church? And um, whereas this is more the way God sees you. So always, always with joy. And then, yeah, just, I thought that was funny too. I said, so person in confession, I don't really have much to confess, Father. And then he has that, so I thought that was funny. <laughs> so we're all sinners, but we're all loved, I think is the essential thing. But how did I get to Colgate? So my, my parents are, my, my heritage, I'm Ethiopian. So my parents grew up in Ethiopia during a socialist uh, era. And, you know, at that time, I think, at least for my family, a lot of people were, is this what kind of socialist were you? Um, and at that time, uh, it's similar in a lot of ways to Catholic history, like the church was the biggest landowner in the country and the church and the emperor were like this. Um, so part of the revolution, one of the, the grievances was the church, this hierarchy needs to go away. Um, but the way my parents raised me, we, we were like Christmas and Easter uh, kind, of, kind of religion, but very critical of organized religion, which I still keep a lot of. Um, and that has affected my faith journey a lot because part of my passion to become a, a religious, become a priest, was to say, like, spirituality is a beautiful thing, but sometimes organized religion also has a lot of things that it has to fix. Um, and we know that as, as Catholics, you have, you know, church abuse, scandal, enslavement, imperialism, all these kinds of things that still we haven't reconciled with in the church, and uh, we have to. Um, so I think I come with a healthy kind of, I want to say, sin but crit critical, critical lens uh, to my faith. Um, but I love this picture. This is an Ethiopian runner, and when she finished the race, you know, she has this picture of, uh, this is a very famous picture in Ethiopia of Jesus and Mary. Um, and just like this, this is just raw faith, I see. And this was part of, like my aunt was my godmother, and she raised me in that kind of a faith. Like, um, it, in, and in our family, we have people from all different kinds of faith. So one thing I grew up with was just your faith, or if you don't have a religion, it's more about who, the kind of values you are, the kind of person you are. So I grew up, I think, with values that I still hold that weren't necessarily Christian, but a lot of them were um, in a big, a big family. So I had a lot of privilege as the oldest kid in my family. I don't know if Brian remember, um, if Mark remembers, but these are some Colgate alums. This is Lewis and uh, Brian Gata, but, um, and Eru, maybe some of you know Eritrea. But, um, but I was very privileged. I was the oldest in my family. Um, and you get a lot of thinking in the, in the style of a family. I could do pretty much whatever I wanted. And, I was very lucky even when I joined the Jesuits. My family wasn't Catholic, but they knew it was what I wanted to do. Um, so they supported me. Um, again, because that's the kind of way we were raised. It wasn't really about what do you profess, more so about your actions. Um, but I went to a Quaker school. Um, I don't know if you heard about Quakers, but very briefly, like every morning, we, this is the Quaker meeting house. So it's like the opposite of a Catholic or Orthodox kind of thing. There's no, there's no icono iconography. There's really no preacher. You sit in silence for a time. If you're moved by the, the light, the Holy Spirit, as, as we would say, uh, you can say something and you can sit down and no one can respond to you. Uh, Quakers are pacifists. So when I was in uh, high school, the 9-11 happened uh, like a mile away. And at that time, everybody was super uh, patriotic, I'll say. So recruiters were in all high schools except ours because Quakers are pacifists. So they even and at that time it was very dangerous because, you, you know, there was a lot of hysteria going on. Uh, and Quakers were like, no, these are our values. We do not allow um, recruiters. And we got to, they let us skip class to go to Union Square to protest the war. So like that, it was, that was the kind of environment I grew up in. I was, I was very fascinated by that. Like I knew religion from like my parents' context and that religion is kind of the status quo, but these guys are also religious and they're very much about justice. So it really made me curious. And then I came to Colgate and I remember one day like, 
um, I don't know, like all my best friends, like I was out, you know, we were all out, you know, doing what Colgate students do. And I, rem I was looking for different, different uh, church communities at the time. And I'll never forget, I opened the door to the chapel and it was all my friends who had been out with me the night before. And I was just like, it just blew my mind because I always grew up in that context that you only go to church if you're all set with God. Like you kind of have to do your homework first and then you meet God. Whereas the, the Jesuit and the Catholic kind of things that I really clicked with more was like God takes you as you are and then you walk with God as opposed to you have to fix yourself first. So that really, that day really captured me. And I said, wow, these Catholics have to, you know, learn more. And then I realized too, like, when I learned more about religions, like Orthodox and Catholic is very similar, if not the same. So uh, it was very easy for me to become Catholic. Um, but I went to Georgetown right after. This, these are two Jesuits. He's a priest now, and uh, he was my sponsor. He, we studied in the same program at Georgetown, and I did RCIA for one year, and then I quit. And then I did the next year, and I stayed. And he was my sponsor. And I, at that time, I, I, was, I studied um, history here, and I wanted to go to Africa and do development. So I went to Georgetown for that. He was my classmate. And he was a, a, a Jesuit in the Congo during the Congo War. I don't know if you guys have heard about that, but one of the most brutal wars, probably the most brutal war since World War II. Um, it's where we get all our you know, technology for our phones. It's part of why that war is going on. Anyway, he was there. And what, what struck me, he was ministering to these women who were rape victims. Because during that war, one of the weapons was a very concentrated form of rape. Like you'd rape someone to scare them, to frighten them, and destroy them in every way. And his job was to minister to them. And it just struck me that like, he would be able to, I was playing, I was like, I wanna go to a nonprofit or something. But it just struck me like, as a man, there's only a certain amount he can relate to them. But in that spiritual level, he was gonna relate to them in a way that I wouldn't be able to, or no one else really could be able to. So that really struck me. And I said, what are these Jesuits all about? And I was like, I, there's something in me moving me towards this. Um, I lived in LA for a while, um, and I went to the Chrism Mass at the cathedral, and that's me over there. Um, someone just asked me, do you, do, you want, do you want to hold the, I was part of this young adult group, so like, oh, do you want to hold the flag? I was like, sure. And I sat there behind all these priests, and I was like, I was like damn, I could do this, like, dang. I was like, I could, do, I could do this, like, this is, I feel very comfortable. I saw my parish priest there, like, who had been to confession and told him everything about me, so like, I was like, I could do this, like. Um, and it's, it's that kind of thing. If you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. I was like, God, this is the craziest thing. You know, I don't, I don't think I can. I remember once I was in a parish in Berkeley, and this guy was, like, becoming a Dominican. And I was like, there's all these beautiful people in California. Are you crazy? Like, what is this guy being a Dominican for? I was like, this guy's an idiot. I would never do that. And it's like four years later, I'm um, joining the Jesuits. But it's like, it's that kind of thing. Like I was saying, the way God calls you, it's like God's going to call you where God's going to call you. Like, you might think it's silly. You're going to end up there regardless. So, and reading these wonderful books like Thomas Merton, um, the, little, the books I would never think I would read. This is a Jesuit who was uh, captured by the Soviets. Um, but just reading these books and being very, a lot like Ignatius was saying, like, I could do this. Like, this is very beautiful to me, um, this lifestyle. Meeting Jesuit, this is Dan Berrigan. He was uh, on the run from the law for like over a year. He's a Jesuit for burning draft cards uh, during Vietnam. And again, that was very um, beautiful for me. Uh, this is a picture in our novitiate. We spent our first two years in novitiate, and uh, I just—I mean, I love that stuff. But it's like, don't don't take yourself too seriously. Too like, God loves you. God laughs with you. And I, I, this, we have this picture. I looked at this picture every day for two years, and it was just a reminder to be like, you might be a priest, but I have a lot of like clerical baggage. Like, I I liked being wearing a collar, but you have to not take yourself too seriously. And this is um. Just I remember going on the trips to visit the Jesuit houses and feeling so inflamed, like I was like, I have to join this. Uh, it's a good friend of mine, he's, uh, he's still a Jesuit, but just being with guys, and a lot of people get surprised when I say like, oh, what, what is the thing you miss the most about religious life? And I'm like, honestly, the intimacy. Because a lot of people, the first thing they'll say about religious life is like, no sex. And it's like, that's very true. And Jesuits very wisely um, train you and talk to you a lot about that and you have to be very open and they don't accept you if you're at a certain place um, with being aware of your own sexuality um, or do you see yourself as a sexual person because they don't want someone who's going to just white knuckle it that's that'll be that that has very bad consequences um, but the thing I miss the most is like you live in these communities people know you you, you love one another you stick up for one another um, and that's a very beautiful thing. And I remember we're leaving, knowing intellectually that would be very hard. But when I left, that was the hardest part of leaving, missing those, you know, those things. Like, yes, you can, you know, do whatever you want and all that. But um, 
there, and I think that's ultimately what religious life tries to do. It's like trying to make these Christian communities, and that's all we're trying to do. Um, but if you want to be a, a religious life, it's just one of many vocations. They call it religious life. I don't think that's a, the greatest name for it, but like you can be contemplative like a monk. You can live off somewhere. You can um, do service like the Jesuits. You can be a teacher, but there's many kinds of life. Um, but for, for Jesuits, they have this 10-year formation to be a priest. You do your first two years, you take vows, then you do studying, work, more studies, ministry, and then you get ordained if you want to be a priest. Um, like I said, it's a very long interview process. I can talk to you about that later. But, um, but kind of to, to wrap up, like the Jesuits is a beautiful experience, and I love this. I still work in a Jesuit school. Um, but Jesuits, like everyone else, we're sinners but called. So one of the things we started working on, and like a lot of guys are still working on, um, and it's, I struggled with it very much initially. The Jesuits is like a largely white upper middle class group. And with that, they have their biases. They have this kind of thing. And, you know, a lot of people think when you join a religious order or when you become a priest or something, you kind of suddenly become holy. It doesn't work that way. Like, people are people. Um, so Jesuits have a really tricky history with enslavement. Uh, this is one of the, the saints. It was it's a, a bit of a problematic saint. Uh, and also, when I was at Loyola, Chicago, there was a police uh, brutality incident on that campus. And being a black student and a Jesuit at the time, I was very hurt, along with a lot of the black students were like, the Jesuits are being very silent. And, you know, you can see over here, like, they have the seal of Loyola on their uh, badges, and they're choking this, you know, Latina student and putting this boy on the ground. And a lot of us struggled with that, and we were like, where's God in this? Because Jesus said God is in all things, and we are like, well, what's, you know, and I brought that a lot to prayer, and I brought that to my community, um, but that was something we struggled with a lot, and I was in a very deep desolation with that. Um, with that being said, like, that thing was, you know, part of the Jesus was like openness, so I brought that you know, to my community, to my formators, and I was like, we have to do something because there are these people who are suffering on our campus in our country, and we have to help them. Um, so what happened was that the, the students themselves, not the Jesuits, made this thing called Not My Loyola, and they advocated, they mobilized, and eventually the Jesuits started to kind of get a, kind of a change of view on campus. They were like, you know what, these are the marginalized. These are the people we have to stand with. Um, and eventually a lot more people started to take them more seriously. Um, and that, that was part of the beauty, because like for me, like one of the, my big, I think, growth areas is like I'm a big people pleaser. And I was very scared to be critical of the Jesuits. And, um, but I was happy that I was able to do that. And there was a lot of consolation on the other side of that. Um, and yeah, just seeing like, you know, Jesuits, like this is the president of the American Jesuits. And I don't know if you guys heard about the Georgetown enslavement situation, but like Georgetown enslaved people to build their campus. And it's not till very, and then, um, so I was in a really bad place with this. I was like, what the heck is going on? And, and a year later, the president of the Jesuits in America was like, he finally apologized to those 272, the descendants of those 272 enslaved people at Georgetown who built Georgetown. And he, he d apologized using the penitential right that we use in mass. He said, we have greatly sinned in our thoughts and in our words and what we have done and what we have failed to do. Um, and I just thought it was beautiful because when I was here, I was like, that will never happen with the Jesuits. The Jesuits can never do that. And here's this, and they're still working on it. And I thought that was a very beautiful thing. Um, and this is just, you know, the life. I worked in a cancer hospital, which is a very intense experience. And that was, again, part of my discernment. It's like, life is not promised, tomorrow is not promised. A lot of those people show up to that hospital thinking like one day they're at work, they collapse and they end up in this cancer hospital and they got a week to live. And it's like, when you look at life in that perspective, you, you learn a lot about your own faith and you learn a lot about what you really want to do uh, in your life. Um, these are some sisters, Mexican sisters I learned Spanish with, and we do a lot of uh, manual labor too. But I mean, even that, God is in all things. We, we, we clean up our own house, which is, a, I think, a beautiful thing and one I kind of miss, but like every Saturday morning we clean the house. But again, like as Jesuit says, God is in all things and you find God in that. Uh, so finally, my last slide, like um, for me, I, I, so I, I was in the Jesuits, like, and then, so every, every year you go on an eight day kind of a refresher retreat. And every time I went on these retreats, I was like, you know, I, I love what I'm doing. I love the guys, but I just think God is not calling me to be a priest. Like, um, even when I was at the, the, the school, when I was a Jesuit, like, I remember, like, a lot of the kids are not Catholic, but we were a Catholic school. So you don't give them communion. You bless them. They come like this. And I remember, like, standing there when I was a Jesuit with my collar and everything and just, you know, so you give them a blessing and just, like, getting to like just physically touch and bless all of these boys, I was just filled with such a consolation, but also confused. I was like, 
I feel right being here, but I don't think I want to be a priest. Like, I want to be with these kids. I want to be there for them, but I don't think it's in this particular way. Um, so, and the retreat, I was just like, I felt God just saying, you know what? Every retreat I would go on, every like twice a year, I'd be like, I don't, you don't have to do this for me. And I was like, really? It took me a long time to have the courage to face that. But, you know, eventually I brought it to my spiritual director, my superiors, and I was like, I think I really need to consider this thing. And they were very open about it. And they said, good, go take your time, do what you need to do. So I got to travel. Like, I did chaplaincy for some kids on campus, like really good kids. I did a lot of prayer by this lake. Uh, I went to Spain. I went on an Ignatian <laughs> pilgrimage to where um, Ignatius is from. Um, my buddy, he's a Colgate guy. He asked me to be his uh, child's godfather, which I was amazed by. And I got to go. This was the room of um, Ignatius's conversion. So we actually got to go to the actual room where he felt the, you know, the aha moment. Um, but even in that, just, you know, as Ignatian spirituality teaches, like realizing that God loves me, but also realizing that getting rid of the baggage that I had, like I have to prove something to God or I have to do something good for God, um, for God to love me. Um, and eventually made the really hard decision a year ago to say, you know what, I can't do this anymore. Um, I'm not being authentic to myself. I'm not being authentic to God. And then getting, you know, of course, the blessing to leave and then uh, doing that. Um, but I think ultimately, like, maybe the key thing from this talk and maybe in my experiences is this beautiful quote. Did anyone have Julian of Norwich? She's this English Catholic mystic. So she was an anchorite. And what anchorites are, they're like, Literally, they would build this enclosure on the side of a church, and they would just live in that thing. They would never leave. And these were very wise and holy people. And she grew up in a very, like, black death, black plague, I mean, and all this kind of stuff. Very depressing time. But she has this book called The uh, Revelations of Divine Love. And she just felt like she was a mystic, and she had this really intimate um, communication with God. And she said, you know, in this very dark times, that all, all will be, she felt Jesus saying, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. And this is the optimism, the kind of, belief that Ignatian spirituality is based on. It's this thing that, like, God's already done all the big work. We don't need any more people to be saviors. We don't need anybody to do this. Just do what the desire God has put in your heart and follow that, knowing that you're loved regardless. And if you start from that point, everything else kind of falls into place. Um, even when you don't really believe it is, it will. And that's kind of my story, too. It's like, in retrospect, I can see everything kind of happened the way it was supposed to happen, even though at the moment it doesn't seem that way. Uh, so I talked a lot longer than I wanted to. So um, any last-minute questions? Oh, I see. Okay. All right, I see.